Uh, good evening, uh, my colleagues, my friends. Uh, uh, happy uh, New Year for Ramadan, uh, Ramadan uh, Karim. Uh, actually, we have uh, uh, activities again of the ACC chapter, as uh, as my name is Mohammed Subhi, Professor of Cardiology, Alexander University. I'm the steering uh, committee, um, assembly steering committee of the ACC chapters uh, in um, uh, Middle East and Africa. Actually, I uh, uh, I remember the Gregory Piazza, professor of cardiology and head of the division of cardiovascular medicine uh, in uh, in Harvard in, in uh, Harvard University. Doctor Piazza, director of vascular medicine section, division of cardiovascular medicine, associate professor of medicine, Harvard Medical School, cardiovascular medicine. Actually, I have uh, an honor to uh, share the session with the, with him and the ECC on behalf of the ECC chapters. And I was um, astonished with the, uh, his experience and very good lecture of the interaction. So uh, I promised the Egyptian part on the ECS chapter that to bring Dr. Rigori with, with us for uh, two lectures today, for two hours, we have uh, Dr. Rigori for uh, one uh, uh, lecture, the first lecture, the atrial fibrillation, PCI, how many medication, for how long, the second one, anticoagulation, special pressure. And in between, by each one, we have a discussion, interactive discussion between uh, myself and the discussant, Dr. Ahmed Al-Amrawi, Dr. Ala Edman, and I saw that Dr. Sanhouri al Shawi is coming. Uh, actually, we also we have chatting. Uh, you can send your questions, and I will uh, answer uh, with, uh, give it to Dr. Gregory and Piazza, and followed by Dr. Sanhouri and Dr. Shawi. Dr. Piazza, uh, the floor is yours, and uh, uh, we have two hours you are sharing with me, and uh, we need your experience with the TRG. Can you explain to us what the TRG uh, uh, group uh, before we, you start your lecture? Sure. So um, TRG stands for Thrombosis Research Group, and it's, yeah. a, uh, it's a group that we do um, here at Brigham and Women's Hospital studying thrombosis in arterial and venous uh, vessels, and it's been since the 1980s a research group, and I helped to direct it. Okay. Uh, be before you start, I'd like to thank also uh, uh, Pfizer company. Uh, actually, Pfizer company is uh, is taking care of the waves. This so is the first wave with a live program, which the, a live program is the the atrial fibrillation value education curriculum. We have. Uh, uh, a few months ago, we have four waves, and this is the second five waves, and this is the second uh, turn of also four to five waves for this curriculum. And I hope to enjoy this uh, uh, this night, Dr. Piazza. The floor is yours now. Thank you so much. It's a real honor to be joining you um, and to be able to see my friends again. Um, my first talk is going to focus on atrial fibrillation, really looking at how many medications and for how long. Here are my disclosures. And this first slide is really to show us that the risk of myocardial infarction increases in parallel with the risk of stroke. Um, and this, these data come from the REACH registry. And it's important because what happens is that over time, providers that take care of patients with a risk of MI and stroke end up having to prescribe medications for antiplatelet therapy and for antithrombotic therapy together. And that becomes very important because when you combine antithrombotic therapy and antiplatelet therapy together, especially if it's triple therapy, you introduce a new risk for the patient. While we're able to reduce the risk of stroke and myocardial infarction, we trade that risk for an increase in the risk of major bleeding, in particular, different hemorrhagic manifestations such as intracranial bleeding. These data from Denmark show that there's a very sharp increase in the risk of bleeding in patients with a history of atrial fibrillation and MI or atrial fibrillation and PCI if they're prescribed triple therapy, which means dual antiplatelet therapy and some antithrombotic medication. 
Woast was one of the first studies to really show us that triple therapy causes bleeding, but it doesn't cause or provide a substantial benefit. I think that many clinicians would be accepting of an increased risk of bleeding if triple therapy provided a strong benefit for a reduction in MI and stroke. Unfortunately, we learned from WOST that Timmy bleeding is markedly increased in patients receiving triple therapy, and that includes GI bleeding, cutaneous bleeding, other sites of bleeding. What's worst is that triple therapy does not provide any significant reduction in myocardial infarction, target vessel revascularization, stroke, um, or other types of thrombotic events. In fact, triple therapy in WOST was associated with a nearly tripling in the risk of death. That, the data from WOST and from registry studies really helped to drive a series of studies that have become very important when it comes to stroke prevention in AFib patients who have also coronary artery disease. So Pioneer AFPCI was the first of these studies. It focused on nearly um, almost, almost more than 2,100 patients with non-valvular AF who had undergone PCI or stenting, and they were randomized to three different groups. The first group was low-dose rivaroxaban, 15 milligrams daily, plus a P2Y12 inhibitor for 12 months. The second group was very low-dose rivaroxaban, 2.5 milligrams twice daily, plus DAPT for one, six, or 12 months. And group three was vitamin K antagonist plus DAPT for one, six, or 12 months. That's group three. And what we can see, the primary safety endpoint was uh, major or clinically relevant non-major bleeding. And group three, the group that had vitamin K antagonist plus DAPT, had a dramatically increased risk of bleeding. You can see that the green line is much higher than groups one and group two. Again, that would be maybe acceptable if there was a strong benefit for reducing thrombotic events. But what we can see in the second part of the curve here, the second panel, we see that there's an important finding. There's no reduction in thrombotic events with the triple therapy group that included vitamin K antagonists, okay? And so this really shows, first of all, that warfarin is associated with an increased risk of bleeding and triple therapy is associated with an increased risk of bleeding. And there's not a benefit when it comes to reducing thrombotic events. Looking at secondary outcomes in Pioneer AFPCI, we can see that across the three groups, none of these major adverse cardiovascular events are lower with triple therapy. And they're especially not lower with triple therapy that includes warfarin. Another study followed Pioneer PCI. This was Redual PCI. Redual included almost 2,800 patients with atrial fibrillation who had undergone PCI and were randomized to warfarin plus a P2Y12 inhibitor, either clopidogrel or ticagrelor and then aspirin for one to three months. Okay, so that was the triple therapy group. There was also a group that was given dabigatran either at 110 milligrams twice daily or 150 milligrams twice daily, plus just a P2Y12 inhibitor, not aspirin, just a P2Y12 inhibitor. And what we can see is the primary endpoint here was again focused on bleeding, and we see that it's higher in patients receiving triple therapy than those receiving dual therapy. We see that for the dual therapy group that got the low intensity regimen of dabigatran. 
And we see it here also for patients that receive the higher intensity regimen of dibigatran, the 150 milligrams twice daily. Triple therapy was always consistently associated with a higher risk of bleeding. Here, we're looking at efficacy endpoint of recurrent cardiovascular events. And we can see that triple, triple therapy, although it was associated with an increased risk of bleeding, it was not associated with a benefit in reducing thrombotic events. The thrombotic event curve is the same for dual therapy as triple therapy. So for an increased risk of bleeding, there's no additional benefit. Here we're looking at safety endpoints in redual PCI, really focused on particular manifestations of bleeding. As I mentioned, the primary endpoint was this composite of major and clinically relevant non-major bleeding. That was higher with triple therapy, and that was higher with triple therapy no matter which intensity of anti, uh, which in intensity of dibigatran was prescribed. There was a higher risk of ISTH major bleeding. Intracranial hemorrhage trended towards being higher with triple therapy. Uh, you just do not see any benefit for the increased risk of bleeding with triple therapy. So these two studies, Pioneer AF PCI and Redual PCI, were then added to WOST in this very nice meta-analysis. And what we can see in this meta-analysis is that dual therapy is consistently preferred when it comes to major and minor bleeding events compared with triple therapy. All of the trials show that dual therapy is better than triple therapy when it comes to safety. And when you put all of that data together into a large meta-analysis, it favors dual therapy over triple therapy. When we look at major adverse cardiovascular events, again, looking at all of the studies put together, there's no benefit to triple therapy. If anything, there's a suggestion that dual therapy trends to be better. So this meta-analysis was the first of a series of meta-analyses that suggested that the era of triple therapy is over. After that meta-analysis, there was one more additional study focused on ACS or PCI in patients with atrial fibrillation, and this was Augustus. Augustus looked at apixaban versus warfarin. The inclusion criteria were atrial fibrillation, the need for antithrombotic therapy, and an ACS or PCI with planned P2Y12 inhibition for six months. This was a very large study, almost 5,000 patients. First, the patients were randomly assigned to apixaban or warfarin. Within each of those groups, patients were randomly assigned to aspirin or placebo, okay? The primary outcome was major or clinically relevant bleeding through six months. And here we can see the primary outcome. Important, the top graph here is looking at apixaban versus vitamin K antagonist. And we observe that using warfarin or vitamin K antagonist was associated with a higher risk of bleeding compared with using apixaban. The lower graph has to do with that second randomization where no matter what group the patient was in, apixaban or warfarin, addition of aspirin on top of a P2Y12 inhibitor and antithrombotic therapy was associated with a very significant increase in the risk of bleeding. Aspirin, when added to antithrombotic therapy and a P2Y12 inhibitor, adds a tremendous amount of bleeding risk. That is the key lesson from this bottom graph. Now, looking at all the different possible regimens, we see that the vitamin K antagonist plus aspirin 
performed the worst when it came for bleeding. That's the purple graph line here, the highest risk of bleeding. Next was a Pixaban plus a P2Y12 plus aspirin. Following that was a vitamin K antagonist plus a P2Y12. And then the best results from bleeding actually were with a Pixaban and a P2Y12 inhibitor with no aspirin at all. This is another um, analysis that was presented at the American College of Cardiology last year. And what it shows is that as time goes on and patients continue on aspirin after an intervention, there's a higher risk of developing fatal intracranial hemorrhage or major bleeding. You can see here that aspirin doesn't really provide th that much of a, it provides a little bit of a benefit, but not a significant benefit, not a large benefit over the first 30 days. More importantly is after the 30 day period, from 30 days to six months, there's a sharp increase in the risk of bleeding with the aspirin if it's continued, but no additional benefit for a cardiovascular death, stroke, MI, or stent thrombosis, okay? So important point to emphasis, within the first month, there's some bleeding associated with con continuing aspirin, but at least there's a benefit for preventing thrombosis. After the first month, there's a great risk of bleeding and no benefit for thrombosis. Following Augustus, there was another meta-analysis. Now, this meta-analysis included Augustus and a number of other studies focused on this, some that we've already talked about. And what we can see here is that double, dual antiplatelet therapy is all or dual platelet, dual um, antiplatelet therapy plus antithrombotic therapy, which we call triple therapy, is associated with a higher risk of bleeding, and dual therapy is favored. Okay, dual therapy of a single antiplatelet drug and antithrombotic therapy, especially when it comes to ISTH major bleeding. There's about a forty percent reduction with dual therapy compared with triple therapy. Intracranial hemorrhage, the worst manifestation of bleeding is much better, is, is much reduced in dual therapy compared with triple therapy. So following all of these studies and following these meta-analyses, a focused update was provided by the European Society of Cardiology. And what we learned from this focused update is that if aspirin is needed, it should be given only for about a month, okay? Only for about a month after ACS or PCI. The P2Y12 continues for anywhere from six to 12 months, depending on the patient's risk of thrombosis. And then we continue the direct oral anticoagulant for protection against stroke. Another way of looking at this is to um, look at this very nice figure that comes from a circulation article from 2018. And what we see in this figure is that the general strategy after PCI and AF patients is for triple therapy around the PCI with discontinuation of the aspirin um, after about a month, then continuation of dual therapy with an oral anticoagulant and the P2Y12 for about a year, and then continuation of antithrombotic therapy after a year. If the patients have a high ischemic or thrombotic risk and their low bleeding risk, we can continue triple therapy out to a month. Then after that, we go to dual therapy for 12 months and then oral anticoagulation thereafter. Patients at a very low thrombotic risk or a high bleeding risk would just get peri-PCI triple therapy and very quickly move to double therapy. And then after six months, 
oral anticoagulation alone. So to summarize, triple therapy is associated with an unacceptable risk of bleeding in patients with atrial fibrillation undergoing PCI. That what makes it most unacceptable is the fact that there is not a benefit and there's a significant increase in the risk of bleeding. There are a number of two agent regimens that focus on antiplatelet and antithrombotic therapy that are more effective, safer options than triple therapy. The other lesson that's very important from Augustus is that aspirin seems to introduce the largest amount of risk. And if we're going to continue antiplatelet therapy with antithrombotic therapy, it should be a P2Y12 inhibitor and not aspirin. And with that, I think we're going to take some questions, if I'm correct, before we yeah. do the next talk. Yeah, thank you very much, Gregory, for this important, uh, which every day practice we are doing PCI with atrial fibrillation. I have, uh, I'll start the questions. If the patient have ischemia, uh, acute coronary syndrome, and the patient develop atrial fibrillation in the hospital, and then you do PCI, and the atrial fibrillation reverts to sinus rhythm. It's ischemia induced. If this patient needs uh, antithrombotics, or this is ischemia driven, and just you relieve the ischemia and give a P2Y12 with aspirin is enough for the patient. Suspecting there's no left ventricular thrombus, good LV function, and he didn't develop before atrial fibrillation. How do you decide? And so if, if the atrial fibrillation is potentially driven by uh, ischemia, which is not the most common, um, and oftentimes there's a recurrent tendency to have that, but if it's truly, truly transient in the setting of ACS, then we usually provide uh, early on the triple therapy to cover the PCI, and then we reassess the patient for atrial fibrillation after at least one month. And if there's no atrial fibrillation, oftentimes I will do a, a ambulatory heart monitor. If there's no atrial fibrillation and no significant risk that the patient will develop atrial fibrillation later, then I will discontinue antithrombotic therapy. The second question. <clears throat> this question I asked it before to different, uh, uh, you know, to Gelman telescope, for example. You know, Gelman telescope is a uh, Yes, uh, yes, yes, excellent. Uh, and a very, he's, you know, yeah. a specialist on antiplatelet therapy. Yes, but he's interested in aspirin. Yes. I'm not especially interested in aspirin because okay. let, let, let's start like this. We have uh, Oost, Reguel, uh, uh, Pioneer, Augustus, and Trustus. So we have five. And this again is triple, maybe only dual, and you continue for, for a long time. The second, if you do, don't have atrial fibrillation, if you have a PCI, and you have a different trials using only P2Y12 without an aspirin. It is five trials, including the global leaders and a lot of this. And in favor, uh, in favor of 36 trials on the other hand. And also the same, that aspirin can be withdrawn within one month, particularly if you have a special stent onyx, uh, uh, Zines 28 or uh, onyx clear, as you all know this. So all of these findings favor that Aspirin has no role in this increasing unsense of bleeding. And also aspirin in primary pre prevention is not a good drug for pre prevention. So why you are we are insisting till now to use aspirin in spite that we have P2. Even you have aspirin intolerance, use P2I12. So how can you evaluate this uh, in the future? So we need... Um... The, the data is there, as you mentioned, showing that aspirin provides very little um, for benefit and very great risk of bleeding. <clears throat> we need to, as a, as a community of cardiovascular specialists, make the first move in removing aspirin from our patients' medication lists. And then, then if we show the rest of the medical community that it's safe to remove aspirin, then the internists, the primary care physicians, they will learn from us. But right now, there's so much reliance on aspirin from tradition that it's very hard. Even, even if you or I as cardiovascular specialists remove aspirin, when our patient goes to their primary care physician, it gets restarted because the primary care physicians haven't learned that aspirin is not providing benefit anymore. 
So we need much more education, much more education focused at the general internal medicine population. Okay, Dr. Amrawi. Hello, Dr. Muhammad. How are you? How are you? Hi. Thank you. Ahmed, any question for you? Very informative yeah. talk. It included many uh, debatable points. But mm. let me ask you, sure. how do you consider the age of the patient and the weight of the patient when you are deciding to give the patient dual or triple therapy regarding the combinations and the duration of therapy, the age and the weight of the patient? So it's a, it's an excellent question, and it's it's a major challenge because age maybe is less of the challenge than uh, weight because age, at least we had in the trials, many elderly patients. The problem is that the studies have demonstrated that the older the patient, the higher the risk of bleeding. And the higher the risk of bleeding, um, the more there's a chance that the antithrombotic therapy is going to be discontinued. So what I consider in patients that are advanced elderly, more than 75, is to as quickly as possible get down to dual anti, to dual um, therapy, a single P2Y12 inhibitor and, and the antithrombotic therapy at a low dose. Obesity is a much more challenging problem because the trials did not include patients that had BMIs, especially above 40. BMI above 40, we don't have a good confidence that DOACs are particularly effective. And so there, I become very worried. And um, sometimes for at least a little bit longer, I'll continue triple therapy. Uh, Dr. Igre, if the patient uh, taking uh, rivaroxaban, 15 milligram, and this is to continue high ischemic risk, and we then we reach it one year, is it uh, you allow for the patient to continue rivaroxaban 2.5 twice rather than 15 at ischemic and maybe preventing uh, uh, the risk of atrial fibrillation, as you know, the second group of uh, Pioneer AF? So it's a good question. Um, if you're going to, um, I, I guess, Mohammed, you mean just continuing um, yes. antithrombotic therapy with no yes. antiplatelet therapy? Yes. So in, in that setting, um, if they have ongoing AF, the 2.5 milligrams twice daily is not a studied, uh, it's not a studied dose for atrial mm -hmm. fibrillation for stroke prevention. So then we would have to go back to at least 15, if not 20. Okay, this the the second P two Y twelve regarding ticagrelor or clopidogrel. Yes. Due in the guidelines, still clopidogrel is the treatment of choice. But in some studies, as you mentioned before, in the Redual and the AB and Gossus, the both both of them. So, how do you advise if you have a risk of bleeding patients uh, to to start the clopidogrel or to shift from ticag to Clopidogrel, or what you're going to do? Um, we typically, um, the, the decision about clopidogrel or ticagrelor is often made in the cardiac catheterization lab based on the um, findings and the, the procedure, the revascularization procedure. If we're going to continue um, P2Y12 inhibitors past one year, if they're on ticagrelor, I'll often switch them to clopidogrel because it's easier for patients to afford. Ticagrelor in the U.S. is expensive, and it often makes uh, too much of a hardship for patients. Um, within the first year or six months, if the interventionalist wanted ticagrelor, I keep ticagrelor. Dr. Sanhuri, do you have any question? Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Dr. Piazza, for your presentation. Um, sometimes I see, um, um, from my experience and with my patients after STEMI, um, I told the patients that I follow you or you should visit me after two months. Um, sometimes I see the patient after two months with uh, exertional dyspnea and the hemoglobin uh, is dropped, dropped from the baseline hemoglobin. Uh, through only two months, the patient on treble anti, I mean the patient on treble antithrombotic medications. So um, how you prevent this from your practice? 
and how frequently you, you, you follow the patient on triple antithrombotic therapy by even hemoglobin level? Uh, that, that's a great question. It, it's standard to at least check um, the hemoglobin on those therapies at least once a year. If they've had bleeding issues, I may follow it. Um, I, I may actually see them in clinic at least twice a year and check it at least twice a year if they have no bleeding issues. If they've had any reports clinically rel clinically. Um, manifested bleeding, then I check the um, hematocrit more often, maybe every, um, is sometimes depending on how much bleeding every month or every three months. Um, the, the way I manage the bleeding risk uh, in these patients is, if at all possible, to emphasize removing aspirin. Yeah, that's true. Okay. And I think the PPI, so you add PPI in all And patients. I think that uh, data from the from studies like cogent uh, suggests that a PPI can be very helpful. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Don't you use, thank you. Don't you uh, yes, you okay. use PPI while giving your patient triple therapy? Yes. Um, oftentimes, uh, patients uh, will be on PPI for triple therapy uh, based on the cogent trial. Yeah. For every patient taking a triple therapy, I think the patient will should be protected by PPI. I agree. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Gregory, for this now to your second lecture regarding anticoagulation in special population. And this will be followed by two cases. Okay, Dr. Gregory. Excellent. So now we will talk about anticoagulation in special populations. Here are my disclosures. And what I wanna do with this talk is talk about vulnerable populations, ones that are at the highest risk for complications of anticoagulation, especially bleeding. We're gonna understand the challenges of anticoagulation in these patient populations. And specifically, we're gonna spend time talking about elderly, patients with kidney dysfunction, and patients with cancer. So we can see that there are many special populations for us to consider. There's elderly patients, patients with chronic kidney disease, patients with cancer, the obese patients, patients with severe thrombophilia. These are all important groups. I'm gonna spend most of my time focused on elderly, chronic kidney disease, cancer, and severe thrombophilia, because that, those are the populations where we now have a bit more data. So if we look at elderly patients to start, the most important thing that we see from this study from 2011 is that anticoagulation, namely warfarin, is the number one reason for emergency hospitalization in patients uh, that are elderly in the United States. There are a number of risk factors for bleeding associated with anticoagulation. Uh, and we learned many of these risk factors from understanding warfarin-associated intracranial hemorrhage. Concomitant antiplatelet agents can double the risk of bleeding, in particular, intracranial hemorrhage. Certain races and, and, and ethnicities are associated with a higher risk of intracranial hemorrhage. Poor hypertension control is associated with an increased risk, twofold increased risk with intracranial hemorrhage. An increased age, especially above 75, can be associated with a two to threefold increased risk in intracranial hemorrhage. Finally, there are some very rare diseases that are associated with very dramatic increased risk of intracranial hemorrhage. And that one of the most important is cerebral amyloid angiopathy. With DOACs, there are other important risk factors that we keep in mind when it comes to bleeding. Advanced age, just like we saw with warfarin, we also see an increased risk of bleeding with the DOACs. 
These can be noted from sub-analyses of Rely, Rocket AF, and Aristotle. The risk of bleeding associated with age is so important that certain of the DOACs have dose reductions based on age. Renal dysfunction is associated also with an increased risk of bleeding, especially those patients that have at least moderate renal dysfunction. And many of the DOACs have dose reductions recommended, especially when there's at least moderate renal dysfunction. As I mentioned with warfarin, concurrent use of antiplatelet drugs is also associated with an increased risk of bleeding with the DOACs. For example, in Rely, patients who were taking aspirin on top of dabigatran had a nearly twofold increased risk in intracranial bleeding. So why, why would elderly patients have an increased risk of bleeding? Well, some of it has to do with changes, normal changes in drug metabolism. There's decreased hepatic first pass metabolism. That's due to a decrease in liver mass and perfusion that we see with age. And it results in increased bioavailability of some drugs. There are changes in body composition, loss of fat stores, which increases volume of distribution for drugs that are lipophilic and decreases volumes of distributions for water-soluble drugs. There's impaired SIP-mediated phase one reactions that can lead to increased levels of antithrombotic therapy. And then there's decreased renal excretion, which increases the bioavailability of some of the anticoagulants. All of the direct oral anticoagulants are at least in part cleared by the kidney. Polypharmacy is very common in our elderly patients. As we see our patients get older, their list of medications gets longer. And long medication lists can be associated with important anticoagulant interactions. This study from Scotland looked at warfarin drug interactions and showed that in the short term, the most common drug to interact with warfarin was an antibiotic. The common antibiotics that interact with warfarin are fluoroquinolones. In the long term, antiplatelet therapy and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are the common interacting medications with warfarin. Here we can see the impact of age on major bleeding in atrial fibril in, 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 sorry, in venous thromboembolism tr major trials. What we see here is that older age, meaning age greater than or equal to 75, was associated with a substantial increase in major bleeding in patients taking a vitamin K antagonist. Now you may ask, well, what about the direct oral anticoagulants? Well, there we also see an increase, a nearly twofold increase in the odds of developing major bleeding with any of the direct oral anticoagulants. One of the predictors of underutilization of anticoagulation in the elderly is the use of antiplatelet drugs. So we just spent some time talking about uh, issues with aspirin. Aspirin, when patients are taking it and have atrial fibrillation, can sometimes lead the doctor to think that the patient is protected from stroke. And because of that, they will not prescribe an antithrombotic therapy. But we know from trials like Averroes, that aspirin does not provide a significant benefit for stroke prevention in atrial fibrillation. And so we must take very careful attention to making sure that the presence of aspirin doesn't prevent us from providing anticoagulation in patients that have atrial fibrillation. Instead, we should stop aspirin if there's not a good reason for it 
and make sure that our patient starts antithrombotic therapy. Other considerations in the elderly that make them vulnerable is the fact that the elderly often have difficulty paying very high co-pays with the direct oral anticoagulants. Adherence can be a problem in elderly patients who are forgetful. They may miss doses. And with the direct oral anticoagulants, the half-life is so short that if they forget a dose, they're unprotected. And then another consideration is falls. Although I will mention, studies suggest that patients would have to fall hundreds of times before the risk of bleeding outweighs the benefit of anticoagulation. When it comes to anticoagulation in the elderly, if you have an anticoagulation clinic, we call that an anticoagulation management service. If you have such a service, that provides a very important benefit to patients. It helps them with adherence to their anticoagulation and with management of anticoagulation around procedures and different interacting medications. In this study published in 2006, the investigators found that anticoagulation management services were cost effective, especially in the elderly. So much so that on repeated simulation, use of an anticoagulation management service was consistently beneficial to our elderly patients. And it can decrease the cost of managing patients. The next vulnerable group I wanna focus on is patients with chronic kidney disease. Renal dysfunction is associated with an increased risk of major bleeding in patients taking vitamin K antagonists. In patients with in patients with venous thromboembolism who are taking a direct oral anticoagulant, renal dysfunction is also associated with major bleeding, not quite to the extent of a direct or of, of a vitamin K antagonist, but still an increase in the overall risk of bleeding. Here we can see that when it comes to um, VTE recurrence, the direct oral anticoagulants across different ranges of creatinine clearance function similarly to vitamin K antagonists. What's important is when it comes to major bleeding, if patients have renal impairment, it's safer for them to be on a direct oral anticoagulant than being on a vitamin K antagonist for treatment of venous thromboembolism. Another way of looking at that, here's looking at anticoagulation using DOAX versus warfarin in patients with chronic kidney disease. We can see that uh, the risk of major bleeding always trends towards favoring the um, direct oral anticoagulant over warfarin. None of the, in warfarin in comparison to any of the direct oral anticoagulants is never favored. It's at least equivalent or the DOAC is the one that's favored. Now, dialysis is a different patient population. In dialysis, unfortunately, there isn't an oral anticoagulant pathway that's, that's dominant or favored. Uh, whether patients are receiving oral anticoagulation with a DOAC or warfarin, unfortunately, um, there's always a increased uh, risk of bleeding and a limited survival in patients with dialysis who have atrial fibrillation. Another important population of patients are those with cancer. Cancer is particularly relevant to the risk of venous thromboembolism. In patients who've suffered venous thromboembolism, if they do so in the setting of cancer, there's a threefold increased risk of having another venous thromboembolic event like pulmonary embolism or DVT. This led to the CLOT trial, which evaluated low molecular weight heparin injections versus oral anticoagulation with warfarin. And as it turns out, Warfarin is not very effective compared with a low molecular weight heparin in patients with cancer and DVT or PE. 
Delta parin, one of the low molecular weight heparins in the clot trial was associated with a 50% reduction in recurrent venous thromboembolism. Hokusai VTE cancer was the first study to look at a direct oral anticoagulant for VTE in the setting of malignancy. Uh, Adoxaban was the drug studied. It was comparable to a low molecular weight heparin. When it came to preventing recurrent venous thromboembolism, but unfortunately, it was associated with major bleeding. The direct oral anticoagulants were subsequently studied uh, in further trials looking at cancer patients. One of them was SELECT D, which focused on rivaroxaban versus daltaparin. This was a much better result than Hokusai VTE cancer. In this study, rivaroxaban performed very well. It reduced the risk of recurrent VTE compared with low molecular weight heparin, and it did not increase the risk of major bleeding. In Adam VTE, they looked at adoxaban versus daltaparin, another low molecular weight heparin trial against the DOAC. And here, we can see that major bleeding was not increased in apixaban, and we can see that prevention of thromboembolism actually favored the apixaban over low molecular weight heparin. The most important trial to date in cancer patients is Caravaggio. This looked at apixaban versus daltaparin and showed that apixaban was associated with a trend towards a reduction in recurrent venous thromboembolism, and it was very safe. It was not associated with an increased risk of major bleeding like what was seen in Hokusai BT cancer. Lastly, I wanna talk about patients with antiphospholipid antibodies. Uh, the TRAPS study looked at patients with triple positive antiphospholipid antibodies, meaning they had a lupus anticoagulant, an anticardiolipid antibody, and an anti-beta-2 glycoprotein-1 antibody. And in these patients who had three different antiphospholipid antibodies, they were randomized to rivaroxaban versus warfarin. And unfortunately, rivaroxaban did not perform well. There was a higher risk of thrombosis with rivaroxaban in these patients. And so right now for patients with triple positive antiphospholipid antibodies, we recommend warfarin. So to summarize for you, the direct oral anticoagulants for the most for most patients represent a major leap forward for stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation and acute VTE therapy by offering similar efficacy but much better safety. In the elderly, those with kidney impairment and those with cancer, there's an increased risk of anticoagulant associated complications. But if we choose carefully, we can provide high-level anticoagulation without dramatically increasing the risk of bleeding. We just have to select our patients carefully. There's further need for studies of the DOACs in other vulnerable groups. And uh, with that, I'm going to say thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gregory, for this. Uh, another important talk. Uh, one month ago, I had a webinar with uh, Jean Kahn uh, regarding... Uh, the use of in renal patients. And he, he has a, a claim or a, something that theory that uh, oral anticoagulant reducing what's known as vascular calcification. And that's why you should stop, uh, don't give oral anticoagulant even in dialysis patients. And your, in your slides here, you said that you can give it in dialysis patients. So how can you interpret this uh, theory of uh, John Cam? No, it's it's very it's a huge challenge because mm. um, the data very limited data, but there are data that suggest apixaban um, should be able to be safely used with adjustment in patients on dialysis. Uh, the truth of the matter is most providers are very reluctant to do that, and so there's not a very good real world experience for using apixaban in dialysis patients. Uh, most of my colleagues and I still would use warfarin in these patients, even though there's still a bleeding risk with warfarin. I think it's just a general hesitancy and a fact that we don't have much experience using apixaban. However, it is something that can be used in dialysis patients, and we have had some patients do okay on apixaban. 
Regarding the cancer patient, you have, you said four trials. Select Adam Kagriel and um, I don't know the, the name of that. And, and, uh, and Hocus, yeah. So do you find a difference between any antithrombotics regarding yes. the long-term therapy for this kind of patient? Because it's the, the beginner of the, the river Averoxapel for select D. So we used, we used to have this one. Uh, the next is Apixapan, the third baby the big How could this high risk of bleeding? How can you choose one of them? Yes. So Caravaggio showed in a lar very large trial that Apixaban works extremely well in cancer patients. Uh, there was even actually a composite endpoint of death and recurrent VTE that showed a benefit. So I think Apixaban is the dominant drug for treating VTE in cancer patients if, if the patient wants an oral option. Um, I worry very much about um, Adoxaban because of the increased risk of bleed, major bleeding, in particular GI bleeding. I think Rivaroxaban needs further study, but it may be a good option. And there are no studies on Dabigatran really for this patient population. Ahmed Amrawi, do you have any question? Do you hear me, Amrawi? He's not hearing you. Okay, Dr. Sanuri. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, I have a question, uh, maybe not closely related to your presentation, but uh, okay. in patient with uh, uh, prosthetic heart valves, uh, mechanical heart valves, do you have any experience uh, about the use of NOAX on those patients? I, I know this is not approved, so what? But uh, do you use off-label uh, NOAX in patients with prosthetic heart valves? No. I think by prosthetic. Me mechanic, by prosthetic me mechanic? Yes, I know mechanical processes. Sometimes we have a mechanical prosthetic valve patient to, on warfarin, and he develops recurrent uh, prosthetic valve thrombosis. Uh, and we have what we call a warfarin resistance. In this patient, do you use off-label uh, NOAX? No, we, we would increase the INR target. Yeah, sometimes okay. we have uh, two patients was difficult to control uh, to, to difficult to uh, to get the target INR due to warfarin resistance. Warfarin resistance, for example, yeah. Oh yes. So my my question is off label. Do you use any new We we, we have not. We have not. No. No. Okay. But yes, yeah, so and you have we have only one trial for bioprothetic valve. Bioprothetic. Yes. 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 The, the river trial. Yes, about bio. The river trial. Yes, yes. And there's the mechanical processes. Yeah. No, no, there, no. There is there is a trial um, that's looking at um, in the onyx valve a pixaban. Mm. On, 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 yeah. on mechanical do you, processes. Doctor Sohe, do you think is there any way to introduce wax to patients with mechanical processes? How can how can we start this? There's very little appetite from the drug companies to look at DOAX in uh, mechanical valves. Um, if, if the study looking at apixaban in onyx valves is favorable, maybe, maybe, maybe we will have renewed interest, but right now, very hard to do that. Yeah. NOAX in general were new drugs that were studied in any substrate of patients that is now in NOAX indicated it was started as a trial. Seven. Why are we reluctant in starting new wax in patients with prosthetic heart valves? For example, in patients with mm -hmm. CPD, we started using new wax, although there were many concerns about new wax in those patients until proved that we can use it. Um, no, the real the real issue is it depends when you say prosthetic valves. If we're talking about bioprosthetic, we have more no, mechanical. Mechanical, because yeah. realign realign showed very poor performance of, of uh, dabigatran uh, yeah. compared with warfarin. There was more bleeding and more thrombosis. It was the worst possible outcome for the trial. Okay. Uh, regarding the definition of Eldry, do you mean uh, it's uh, Eldry or uh, octogenarian? Because it's, uh, it's 75 or less than more than yeah. 70. I know that Sanori have a case of that, yeah. and it's be 85. How we can differentiate between this and also the age difference, racial age difference is completely it's different. Very, Japan, very, like, yeah. How can varies, you make it? It varies um, from study to study and what they consider elderly or not. In general, it's greater than 65, but 65 year olds these days are very vibrant. I consider it more after 75 or octogenarian. 
Okay. Uh, any question again? Those. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, I think thank you very much, Dr. Gergi, uh, you are joining us for the uh, the chairing for the next two cases. Uh, uh, um, now, Dr. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, Mohammed. Is it okay if I answer a page? After we uh, listen to uh, Dr. Gregory regarding um, PCR and atrial fibrillation and then in the special population, we'll have two cases. Uh, and these cases will be interactive. Uh, the first case with the atrial fibrillation in the elderly as a special population is very popular to, to have atrial fibrillation in the elderly. Uh, and the presenter will be Dr. Professor Dr. Mohammed Sanhuri, is a lecturer of cardiology at the University, one of the pioneer of uh, Electrophysiology in our department and we now in Egypt. Dr. Sanhuri is going to uh, give a case, and uh, me and Dr. Amra will interact with, with him during maybe we can stop him at the case and then we discuss. Uh, if you have any question from the audience, you can send me chatting and all question answer. Dr. Sanhuri, floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Sophie, for the introduction. Uh, my case today will be an uh, elderly lady with atrial uh, pipe relation. Uh, the case is interactive, so as Professor Sophie mentioned, you can stop me at any time and ask me a question. Uh, this is a case of a 76 year old uh, lady complaining of fatigue over the last three days. Uh, she has a past medical history of anxiety, of recurrent gastritis, and the gastroesophageal reflux treated with intermittent PPI. She has also a history of type 2 diabetes with good glycemic control. The patient denied any shortness of breath or chest pain. Her lab profile is unremarkable. Hemoglobin A1C is 7. Hemoglobin level is 11.5. The EGFR is 56. That's to say moderate renal impairment. This is very important in this patient for therapeutic implications. The body weight is 59 kilogram. Uh, the vital signs are um, uh, well controlled except for irregular, irregular pulse with the heart rate of about 118 beat per minute. ECG was ordered and it confirmed the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response. The ventricular response was about, uh, as I mentioned, 118 beat per minute. And uh, through her uh, GP, she was prescribed aspirin 81 milligram per day. After two days, the patient still complained of fatigue and increasing dyspnea on exertion, but no chest pain or dyspnea at rest. Uh, as you know, atrial fibrillation is not a benign clinical condition. And when present, it multiplies the risk of mortality by two, and it increases the risk of stroke by five folds compared to uh, general population. Due to the fact that uh, there is loss of mechanical activity of the atrium with blood stasis and the formation of thrombi, mainly in the left atrial appendage with subsequent systemic embolization. In elderly, the AF usually presents with a permanent form, permanent form of atrial fibrillation. The prevalence is steadily increasing with age. As ETRIA study uh, told us, uh, when, uh, the prevalence in patients less than 55 years is about 0.2%, and it increases to more than 10% in elderly patients more than 75 years. And I mean by elderly in, in my presentation, uh, patients more than 75 years old. This is the term used in the guidelines. AF presentation in elderly is usually subclinical or silent, because the ventricular rate is usually controlled, being less active and having uh, associated evenodal disease, which is common in this special group of patients. So the diagnosis is usually made incidental, and the elderly could present by one of the complications of atrial fibrillation, like stroke, worsening heart failure, or angina. Why elderly patients are at a particular risk for atrial fibrillation? As you know, with aging, there is increased the prevalence of comorbidities like hypertension, heart failure, and ischemic heart disease, together with diabetes and obstructive sleep apnea. All this will lead to left atrial dilatation and inflammation. With progressive dilatation and inflammation of the atrium, there will be some interstitial fibrosis in the atrium, creating the substrate called left atrial remodeling. This is a substrate to develop atrial fibrillation. If we add a trigger like a pulmonary vein ectopic, atrial fibrillation will develop and start. And once atrial fibrillation starts, it leads to progressive more inflammation and dilatation in the atrium. That's why we, we, we say AF begets AF. What are the goals of treatment in our patient? Our patient is elderly patient with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, symptomatic. When we treat this elderly patient, we have two important goals. 
The first is to prevent the thromboembolic event. This is the most important, to prevent stroke, which leads to reduction in mortality by the use of anticoagulants. And the second goal is to improve the quality of life by reduction of symptoms and hospitalization. This is achieved through rate and rhythm control. The guidelines told us that in any patient with atrial fibrillation, you should assess the risk of stroke. I mean atrial fibrillation, the non-valvular variant. That's to say the patient has no prosthetic heart valve and they have no moderate to severe mitral stenosis. So this patient was non-valvular atrial fibrillation. We start with assessment of the stroke risk using the popular shads vask score to identify patient who is candidate for oral anticoagulants. At the same time, we should assess the risk of bleeding for the safety by using the HASP lead score. And if the score is three or more, this means that this patient, this elderly patient, are at increased risk of uh, bleeding, and we should follow him more uh, closely. This flow chart of the guidelines uh, told us that uh, how to how to deal with oral anticoagulants in elderly. The first step is to identify the low risk patient through the Shad Zavask score. The low risk patient means that this patient has Shad Zavask score of zero if he is male, and one if she is female. If the patient has low risk of stroke, no antithrombotic medications, even aspirin, is indicated. If the patient has shared the VASC score of one or more in male, two or more in female, this patient will be a candidate for oral anticoagulation. And at that time, we should calculate the HESP lead score. And what is very important to emphasize here is that high bleeding risk score or high HESP lead score does not contraindicate oral anticoagulation, but it indicates that this patient needs a risk factor modification and the more close follow-up. After we start the oral anticoagulation, we should give the preference to new oral anticoagulants, especially in elderly over vitamin K antagonists due to established safety and the efficacy profile. This is a Shad's VAS score and the score, as you all know. Uh, as, as Dr. Piazza told us uh, that in elderly group, there is a special pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic properties of drugs. There is a reduced absorption and reduced first pass effect so the bioavailability of some medications, whether antiarrhythmic or anticoagulant, could increase and predispose to toxicity. Also, the plasma, plasma protein concentration reduces with aging. So the free serum morphine, for example, is increased and predisposed to bleeding. The metabolism and the activity of hepatic cytochrome metabolic system is reduced. So the dose of some drugs need, need to be reduced or modified. And the elimination also through the kidney is, uh, is different in elderly from young patients because with aging, there is some reduction in the EGFR and the glomerular filtration rate with reduced elimination of some drugs dependent on kidney elimination. So the drugs which depend on hepatic elimination include warfarin, class 1C antiarrhythmics, amiodarone, metoprolol beta blocker, and the two NOACs, apixaban and rivaroxaban, which are eliminated mainly through hepatic root. Uh, the other drugs which depend on the renal el elimination include sotalol, digoxin, and dobigatran. Among the wax, dobigatran is eliminated uh, uh, around 80% of it through the kidney. Vitamin K antagonists are somewhat problematic in elderly because elderly patients, due to the fact of uh, systemic inflammation, malnutrition, lack of protein in diet, they may have increased the serum water level due to reduced binding, binding to albumin. So uh, elderly patient on warfarin or on vitamin K antagonist should be more closely monitored and the INR should be measured every 15 to 21 day. NOACs are included in the major trials of uh, uh, the NOAC, sorry, uh, NOACs uh, in the major trials included a significant proportion of elderly and it proved that uh, NOAX and elderly are equally effective or non-inferior to warfarin uh, at the cost of somewhat increased risk of bleeding. And so in some uh, of the NOAX, the dose of uh, uh, the drugs should be modified in elderly to the reduced dose regimen. Okay, this meta-analysis uh, studied the uh, difference between uh, NOAX versus warfarin in elderly patient, and it included uh, more than 28,000 elderly patient. And it proved that NOAX has lower incidence of stroke and the systemic embolization, and even major bleeding. 
when compared to warfarin, and it recommends uh, use of Nuax in elderly over warfarin, with Abixaban shows the most uh, or the superior safety profile. Uh, NOAC, uh, we may need to reduce or uh, modify the dose of NOAX. By the way, NOAX or DOAX are interchangeably used terms. Both are correct. Uh, the dose should be, uh, maybe need to be modified in elderly based on the age. Like the Bicatran, if the patient is octogenarian above 80 years, you may uh, uh, use the low dose. And in Apixaban, if the patient is more than 80 years, you may again use the uh, lower dose of the uh, drug. Uh, drug uh, anticoagulants, uh, oral anticoagulants in general, are contraindicated in patients with acute clinically significant bleeding and in patients with gastrointestinal diseases like esophageal varices, peptic ulcer in the last three months, and patients with unexplained and untreated anemia. Again, patients with intracranial hemorrhage, previous history of intracranial hemorrhage at any time, uh, or patient at high risk for falls, as Dr. Uh, Biazza told, a patient with uh, repeated falls at risk of injury or uh, head trauma. So back to our patient, uh, to remind you, our patient is elderly patient with non-valvular atrial fibrillation. She had uh, she had the VASC score of four and the has split score of only one. So she is or she has a straightforward indication for oral anticoagulation. And when you prescribe oral anticoagulant in this patient, give the preference to Duax or Nuax. So the patient was started on Rivaroxaban, 20 milligram uh, once daily, and the metoprolol 25 milligram once daily for rate control. One week after uh, the prescription of those medications, the patient felt much better, uh, but uh, the pulse uh, rate dropped to 46 and regular sinus bradycardia. Uh, so the dose of metoprolol was reduced to half and the patient was scheduled for follow-up. The second goal of treatment, as I told you, is to improve the quality of life by reducing the symptoms and the hospitalization, and this is achieved through rate or rhythm control. So an elderly patient, whether we uh, we will start with rate or rhythm control, this is a debatable. But most of the data and the guidelines are recommended to start with rate control strategy. And in a firm sub-study, beta blockers are the most effective uh, even though the blocking agent to control the rate of atrial fibrillation, followed by non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers if beta blockers could not be used. Digoxin could, could be used in this particular patient if they have acute heart failure. But if they don't have acute heart failure, there is a concern about the use of digoxin because uh, as elderly patients, sometimes the renal functions is impaired and there is a risk of, for toxicity with digoxin. Amidarone could be also used for rate control but it has a considerable extra cardiac side effects. So what is the target of rate control in elderly patient? And, in, and generally in AF patient, when we adopt a rate control strategy, elderly patient are at a particular risk for bradycardia, as I told you, and AV block even. So we should adopt and follow here a lenient rate control strategy, as the guideline told us. The lenient control strategy, lenient rate control strategy, is the target from 80 to 110 beat per minute at rest. And do not to follow the strict rate control, which uh, necessitates a reduction of the resting rate below 80 beat per minute to avoid the uh, risk for bradycardia. If uh, the patient is not controlled on rate control strategy, we can shift to the rhythm control strategy, whether by pharmacological medications or electrical cardioversion. But in elderly, pay attention to the risk of proarrhythmia. Proarrhythmia could be induced easily with class one and the three agents by induction of prolonged QT and polymorphic VT. And the QRS duration should be monitored closely and it should not exceed 150% of the baseline QRS uh, duration. So the recommendation in elderly is to follow the patient after beginning the antiarrhythmic uh, medications by one to two weeks and to perform ECG and to measure the QRS duration. If the QRS duration is increased by more than 150% of the baseline, you should stop this antiarrhythmic medication. And there are some recommendations about performing exercise tests after one to two weeks of beginning the antiarrhythmic medications in order to disclose any QRS widening at high rates. Also, when we use class three antiarrhythmics, the amiodarone and the sotalol and the fetilide, when you use any of the class three antiarrhythmic medications, you should follow closely the QTC interval, and it should not exceed 520 milliseconds. 
and particularly in elderly patients, you should measure on periodic intervals the renal functions and the serum electrolyte level because any disturbance of the electrolyte level or increase in the renal function could affect the metabolism or elimination of the antiarrhythmic medication or could induce QTC prolongation and decrease both the patient to proarrhythmia. So uh, back to our patient, we follow the patient after starting a regimen of rivaroxaban 20 and uh, metoprolol 12.5 milligram per day. After four months, the patient was presented with worsening exercise capacity and the CBC revealed hypochromic microcytic anemia with hemoglobin level 6 gram per deciliter and positive occult blood for stool. After transfusion of three backed RBCs unit and the aggressive gastric protection with PPI, the hemoglobin level was improved to 9.5. And then upper GI endoscopy was performed, revealing chronic gastritis with no evidence of tumors or ulcers. After stabilization of the patient condition and after discussion of the, uh, with the colleagues, we started a rivaroxaban dose uh, at reduced dose regimen, 15 milligram only per day with omeprazole 20 milligram twice daily and we scheduled the patient for follow-up. But after three months again, the patient was presented with worsening fatigue and dyspnea. And at this time, the hemoglobin dropped again to 5.5 gram per deciliter with positive occult blood in stool. So RBC's transfusion was done and the patient was symptoms was much improved. But now we come to the very important and difficult question, whether to reinitiate oral anticoagulants again or not, because this patient developed twice GI bleeding with marked reduction and severe anemia with worsening of the symptoms. Uh, can can yes. you come back a few slides, the slides of those adjustments? You have a table of different drugs. Uh, just to have one minute, yes, stop this. Yes. Uh, look at this, look at this. For uh, a big span, the bigger trend, the age more than 80 here is concerned. River span is not respecting the age. Yes. Uh, the body weight is uh, respected for edoxapan, apixapan. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. The creatinine is, is, is mainly for river exapan. Uh, Absexapen and Edoxapen, and yes. then in Doxapen you have drugs. So you are, you are completely different from these. Uh, Gregory, you, you have just joined us. Yes. Can you uh, you have an to illustrate for for the those who are going to to tackle the drug, which drug for which patients? Uh, sometimes uh, one of them is uh, reducing bleeding, uh, uh, GIT bleeding, than the others claiming this. Some uh, claiming of renal rather than others. Please take some time for this. Yes, of course. So uh, the the selection. First of all, the important thing to recognize is that in general, the DOACs are going to be the best option for our patients over warfarin, with the exception of a few special populations. So if you can choose a DOAC over warfarin already, you're doing the right thing. The next challenge is picking the correct DOAC. So um, a few things, dabigatran is uh, a, you know, in rely for uh, stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation. It provided a very, very substantial reduction in ischemic stroke. Uh, the gr relatively speaking, and we can't compare one DOAC to another, but if you look at the reduction in stroke relative to warfarin, in RELY, dabigatran had the greatest stroke reduction. So in patients that might have had a prior stroke, um, sometimes we use dabigatran because of that dramatic reduction in, in stroke. Now, dabigatran um, can be a difficult medication to take in patients that have gastrointestinal problems. Patients who have... Um, gastroesophageal reflux disease or ulcer disease don't typically always tolerate dabigatran very well because the dabigatran capsule has an acidic coating that if you're sensitive to stomach acid, you might have abdominal pain from it. So we tend to, patients with many stomach or digestion problems, avoid dabigatran. Okay? Yes. Rivaroxaban is an interesting uh, option for patients that want a once daily medication. Um, it's uh, easy to take. 
they don't have to remember the medication twice. One of the challenges with rivaroxaban is one of the most common side effects is headaches. So in patients that are prone to migraine headaches, we try to potentially avoid rivaroxaban because if they have headaches, they're going to be stopping the rivaroxaban frequently and we don't want that, okay? Yeah. Apixaban in- But sorry, in, sorry, GIT yeah. bleeding here. About the river XFN. So, in a comment study, of this, yeah. yeah. Compared with warfarin, there's a suggestion that river oxaban may have an increase in GI bleeding, although overall it's a reduction in, in other types of bleeding. It's good that you asked that question as I was getting to apixaban, because apixaban is the medication that, compared with warfarin, seems to have a lower risk of GI bleeding. Um, the only main challenge with the Pixaban is it's twice daily. So patients have to remember to take it twice. But um, it, as far as uh, side effects, it doesn't have a, a typical nuisance side effects like uh, Dabigatran has stomach issues and Rivaroxaban has headaches. A Pixaban, you don't really see that. A Doxaban, the, main, the, the good thing about a Doxaban is it's once daily. And it was associated with a very nice stroke reduction in Engage AF. Uh, the challenge with the doxaban is it's not uh, widely available. Um, in the United States, it's the most difficult DOAC to obtain. Most pharmacies don't carry it regularly, so it has to be ordered specially, and it can be expensive. So we, we have to be careful in which patients we use the doxaban. Okay, so regarding the patient of Dr. Sanhori, he has uh, twice uh, uh, GIT bleeding and positive ocular blood. And uh, so the quiz question, what to do regarding oral anticoagulation? Amrawi, Dr. Amrawi. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Oh, yes, okay. I think for this patient, if the endoscopy that was done before showed only that this patient have only gastritis without any pathological lesion that can be treated, for example, AVMs or something like polyps or something like that, that can be treated by cautery. Uh, because I had uh, some patients who had uh, significant bleeding on anticoagulation and were referred to the gastroenterologist, uh, they had uh, some cauterizations for AVMs or some polyps and the bleeding stopped and they continued with the regular doses of anticoagulation. Uh, if the patient is only having gastritis, I think using uh, protein bomb inhibitors together with H2 blockers, together with something uh, a surfactant for the, um, for the gastric mucosa will protect such mucosa from the gastritis and the bleeding that may occur with the anticoagulation. And record the patient to a lower dose of a safer anticoagulant on the GIT for example, apixaban. We can reinitiate apixaban and follow up the patient at uh, a shorter intervals. For example, after one month with uh, a CBC and the hemoglobin level, if it's considerably fine, we can go with the apixaban. And if not, we can use a lower dose of apixaban. I think this is the strategy that can be done in these patients. Taking in mind also that using proper gastric protection may protect and reduce the risk and instance of gastritis that occurs with rivaroxaban or other nox. To Ahmed Shawi, you just joined. Did you hear uh, Ahmed Shawi? Uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I had technical problems. That's why I joined late. Thank you so much for having me with Professor Sophie, Professor Piazza. It's always a pleasure, Ahmed. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Um, it's, it's a really big dilemma. What to use, when to use, and... Um, Definitely, um, I agree totally that um, since 2016, the guidelines suggested that in GI bleeds, the uh, safest thing is either give apixaban or give warfarin. Uh, but again, we, with us using more and more antiplatelets, anticoagulants, definitely like Professor uh, Ahmed uh, just said, yes, we should have a lot of gastric protection from the PP2, uh, PPIs and H2 blockers and so and so. Um, um, in, in this case, I, I think it seems a little bit easier what to choose here, really. Uh, Gregory, do you, yeah, uh, do you have any comments? 
Yeah, I thought I, th I thought it was really important that the both of the previous comments about uh, uh, gastric protection and also um, as part of that, making sure that if you can find the cause of the gastritis uh, and address that, sometimes it's not can't be addressed endoscopically. Sometimes it's a medication like use of NSAIDs. If you can, if you can remove the the inciting agent for the gastritis, you can make anticoagulation much safer. But I also agree that uh, a good option is gastric protection and the use potentially of a Pixaban. Um, those those are are excellent thoughts um, because it's so important, right, that this patient get back on anticoagulation. So what do you what you did? Uh, okay, uh, uh, I agree with, with all what was uh, said. Uh, we should shift for another uh, NOAC like Abixaban with, with safer profile. And uh, I think it should be sh chosen from the beginning uh, with aggressive gastric protection. Uh, but for the sake of presentation, I'll continue if, uh, with, with this scenario. If the patient was shifted to Abixaban with aggressive gastric protection and they still have uh, GI bleeding and the reduction is hemoglobin level, what to do? Maybe you have uh, a cancer. So, this patient cancer stomach. No, he don't have cancer. <laughs> no, I mean, okay. this is the type of patient where now you have to start thinking about left atrial appendage occlusion. Yes, yes. this is what I'm yes. intending to say. So the mm -hmm. 2020 guidelines on management of atrial fibrillations, the European guidelines, they recommend the left atrial appendage occlusion for stroke prevention in patients with atrial fibrillation and the contraindication to long-term anticoagulant treatment like patients with intracranial bleeding. And this is a class 2B based on the landmark trial, Protect AF trial, which shows that Watchman device was non-inferior to warfarin regarding the stroke risk and the superior in the bleeding risk with fourfold higher risk of procedural complications like pericardial effusion. Uh, in this trial, the mean age of the patient was 72. Is that uh, most of the patient included in the trial were elderly and the protocols used for antithrombotic medications post-implantation was warfarin for six weeks followed by that for six months and then a salicylic acid indefinitely. The ASAB study also shows that Watchman was not inferior to warfarin, even in patient with contraindication to short-term oral anticoagulation after implantation. So the protocol of antithrombotic on this trial was uh, six months uh, DAPT, followed by long-term acetyl salicylic acid. Catheter ablation has very, uh, still important role in those particular group of elderly patients. Uh, as, as we said before, the rate control strategy has a lot of problems with extreme bradycardia, which could develop uh, with the patient and, and worsen his symptoms. And also the antiarrhythmic drugs have many concerns in elderly patients, the risk of proarrhythmia and the drug interactions. But in elderly patient, the main, uh, uh, most of the elderly patient, uh, more than 75 years, are excluded from catheter ablation trials. And the main volume of data was derived from trials, including younger patients with no heart disease or comorbidities. But there are a number of small uh, trials showed similar success and adverse events using radiofrequency ablation between elderly and young patient, and there is a definite role for uh, cryoablation. In this trial, catheter ablation of atrial fibrillation in elderly group uh, of patients uh, was safe and less effective than young patients in maintaining sinus rhythm, and we can imagine that uh, elderly patients have a more advanced substrate. That's why the uh, long-term maintenance of sinus rhythm is lower than young patients. Uh, there is a place also for avinodal ablation and the pacemaker implantation if the patient is unresponsive or intolerant to the rate and the rhythm control strategy and at the same time not eligible to rhythm control by uh, catheter ablation of atrial fibrillation. But the drawback of avinodal ablation and the pacemaker implantation, it turns the patient into pacemaker dependent and uh, it allows the AF to persist and contribute to the onset of heart failure. Uh, there is some data about the upstream therapy and its role in prevention of the incidence of new onset atrial fibrillation with the use of RAS blockade statins and the omega-3 fatty acids. So my final take home message, the prevalence of atrial fibrillation is increasing steadily with advancing age. More than 10% of the elderly patient could have atrial fibrillation. As a, as a form of atrial fibrillation, elderly is uh, almost a permanent AF. Elderly patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation should be prescribed oral anticoagulation with the preference for NOACs over vitamin K antagonists. 
rate control strategy is reasonable to start with, and the target heart rate should be between 80 and 110 beat per minute, the lenient uh, rate control strategy, and, and the catheter ablation could have a role in patient who is not responsive to uh, the rate and rhythm control uh, strategy, and is still symptomatic despite the use of antiarrhythmic medications, ablate and pace strategy is the last resort. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sanwari, for this uh, wonderful uh, Sanwari, we can divide your talk into that rate of rhythm control and the problem of the age uh, regarding the left atrial closure device or ablation of the atrial fibrillation. Let's speak about the rate of rhythm. Actually, in practice, uh, nowadays, in the last two years, I found a lot of low atrial fibrillation in elderly, and this relieved by DC shock. Yes. Uh, I think it's bit, what's better. I tried the rate control. But actually, for the late, uh, those who have a uh, uh, preserved ejection fraction and low atrial fibrillation, usually the patient will be intolerant to the rate uh, control. So uh, uh, I need the pract your practice. Uh, this is theoretically, we can change into practice. How can, if it's a DC shock is normal, it, it's successful, so it's better. The second, for, can, can you read this question to the, to, the, uh, to the chairman first and then go to the next, next uh, question? Dr. Gregory? What do you think about the rates in, in your experience in your in, in your TRG? Hmm. Yeah, I well, it, I think that um, every patient deserves a trial uh, in for sinus rhythm if we can convert them. Um, I, I I think that based on some of the studies, rhythm control with an antiarrhythmic agent probably is the least favorable approach. Uh, if you can convert the patient to sinus rhythm uh, with a cardio version, even if you need an antiarrhythmic agent for a little while, that's okay. That seems to be a good option. Uh, the reason it's a good option is it also helps to provide weight control and to prevent tachycardia mediated cardiomyopathy and heart failure. Um, ablation also, I think for many patients, I still actually think we don't use ablation often enough. We should be considering it in more patients uh, because I think atrial fibrillation has a lot of unwanted consequences when it's left uncontrolled. Um, and, and so I, my, fa my, my, my position would be to favor a trial at rhythm control with conversion, not just with an antiarrhythmic drug with no attempt at conversion or ablation. Okay, uh, Dr. Amrawi. Amrawi. Thanks, Mohammed, for your good presentation. Uh, let me uh, discuss this point from another view. If you have an elder patient with atrial fibrillation and you decided to uh, treat the patient with a rate control study, uh, sorry, a rate control medication as you did in your patient. And then with the follow-up, you found that your patient regained his sinaturism. Are you going to shift the patient to an antiarrhythmic or you will just continue with the rate control medication that you started together with anticoagulation? Your patient was treated with metoprolol and then the patient regained her sinaturism with sinus bradycardia. Will you shift this patient to an antiarrhythmic to maintain her sinus or should, or you will or will you continue on me to prolong with anticoagulation? Um, I thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for your question. I think uh, the main aim of treatment of elderly patients with atrial fibrillation is to protect them against stroke. This is number one. So if we prescribe the good oral anticoagulant, the patient is protected. Regarding the symptoms, uh, you, you mean if the patient regains sinus rhythm after starting a rate control strategy. Uh, I think it, it will depend on the frequency of atrial fibrillation episode. For example, if it is one attack only of atrial fibrillation and the patient regained the sinus rhythm, I will not prescribe any antiarrhythmic medications because antiarrhythmic medications have a lot of concerns and uh, uh, side effects and drawbacks in elderly patients. But for example, if the patient has very frequent episodes of atrial fibrillation, I think he will be candidate for a rhythm control strategy between episodes in order to prevent the episodes of atrial fibrillation. And in this patient, I think about catheter ablation. Will you do a halter for this patient to be sure that the patient is maintaining or, may, or is maintaining her sinus rhythm for 
a prolonged duration, or will you consider this as an approximate atrial fibrillation and the patient will be anticoagulated and we'll do it like this? I think if he has symptoms, if he has symptoms uh, uh, compatible with atrial fibrillation and, and at office uh, he is in sinus rhythm, I can uh, perform a halter searching for subclinical uh, or episodes of out of office episodes of atrial fibrillation. But if, if he has no symptoms to suggest AF recurrence, I will not perform halter monitoring. Uh, Sanuri, regarding the AF ablation in the LV, I know that you are doing AF ablation, one of the pioneers of AF ablation in Egypt. Do you think any, any complications between the elderly patient? I know AF ablation is not successful, except maybe in 70% of the patient. You have to redo the AF. In the elderly, it's difficult to, uh, to do pulmonary vein uh, isolation uh, and doing uh, maybe left and right. So because if you have an age of 80, and this is an atrial fibrillation, it's not easy to, uh, to, ablate, to ablate this kind of, uh, because sometimes difficulty of, you have to do MRI to see, to see how to make it, atrial fibrillation is atrial monitoring is different. So how can you decide this for these, such kind of patients? I think we should be highly selective when we refer the patient for atrial fibrillation ablation. Uh, we select the patient with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, um, not much structural uh, substrate in the in the heart. Um, the left atrium is not enlarged beyond 50 millimeter, for example. If we select the patient at early stage of atrial fibrillation before structural remodeling, uh, the patient has paroxysmal or early persistent atrial fibrillation, we can optimize the results of the procedure. And the cryoablation could be performed easily in elderly patients with comparable safety and efficacy to even young patients. But if the patient has long standing persistent, large left atrium um, or permanent variant of atrial fibrillation, I think is a, is a success of the procedure will be very low. And in this patient, I, I will not refer him for catheter ablation. Okay. So it's a matter for, of uh, initial selection. To Rahmat Shawi, do you have, do you, uh, can add anything to this? Um, okay. This has been lovely. Uh, and uh, I, I think the discussion is really pointed out very important things, when to ablate, when not to ablate, and how important stroke prevention is. And this is a really a lovely uh, presentation. Thank okay. you so much, Dr. Mohammed. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Sanhouri. And uh, now uh, the last speaker is uh, Professor Ahmed Shawi, Professor of Cardiology at Shams University. He's going to speak about CKD and interface. You know, Gregory is, uh, spent some time in uh, such patients. I do. Ahmed Shawi was not there, so we don't know what's what's Gregory said. Uh, so I'll wait. Sure, sure. <laughs> <Okay>. So, uh, <laughs> so we have a great uh, debate now between Ahmed Shawi and Gregory regarding a CKD or and be great interview. agreement too. Yeah, <laughs> or, or, my, or a great agreement. <laughs> it, it, it was my loss. That's definite. Thank you so much <laughs> for the introduction, Professor Sophie, Professor Piazza. So sorry, I had a problem that I was going to be late, and then a technical problem. That's what made me a little bit late. But it's always lovely having, uh, you know, being present with you guys. Thank you so much. So um, I was told it was a case presentation. So um, let's take it from a case presentation's perspective. Uh, this is a, a quite young patient. He's 58, uh, 71 kilograms uh, blood pressure. He's hypertensive and diabetic on amlodipin and uh, cetagliptin. Um, his his, his um, um, blood sugar is well controlled, but his blood pressure, as you can see, is not to target. But he started to uh, complain of recurrent palpitations over the last uh, couple of months. And um, with the laboratory investigations, he had a creatinine of 2.1. So actually, I, I would like the panel and ask the panel for the first question. Uh, after this, this is the ECG. You can see definitely it's an atrial fibrillation. Um, it, it is a borderline LVH. It's not really that much LVH, but his blood pressure is not well controlled. But the first question is just creatinine level enough to assess renal function? I, I, don't, I don't know what uh, the panel would like, if anybody would like to comment on that. I'm, I'm happy to, to mend. I, I, th I think that we often use it to assess renal function, but if you look at the, the guidelines from, uh, especially in this patient that has di right diabetes, um, if you look at the guidelines from the American uh, Diabetes Association or other, other organizations, they would say that creatinine is not enough, that you should be getting a urine, um, urine, uh, urinary album to creatinine ratio. Um, you should be assessing for microalbuminuria. 
Um, there should be at least an EGFR or creatinine clearance. Um, some people use cystatin C. I mean, that, I think that there's enough in the guidelines to suggest that currently creatinine is not adequate to fully assess renal function. Um, and I went back to what we say the cornerstone of renal guidelines, which are uh, the Cadigo guidelines. And since 2012, actually, uh, this is uh, actually a screenshot from the 2020 guidelines, and they still have the 2012 definition of what is CKD or chronic kidney disease. As uh, you know, very nicely said by Professor Piazza, it's either a reduction in the GFR, and the GFR, preferably, it is measured, measuring the urine, measuring the creatinine, going into different uh, uh, estimations, but it can be. Uh, estimated by an offline uh, calculator using the Cogrop formula or the MDRD, or if you have loss of protein in the uh, urine. So actually, creatine by itself, it does, it is, it important. It's not as accurate as estimating the GFR or the creatine clearance. Thank you so much, Professor Piazza, for that lovely answer. And actually, we use the Cogrop Gold formula. I know that um, estimating, and that's why it's called an estimate of the GFR or the creatine clearance, but it is quite accurate. And we did it for the patient and it turned out to be 38.5. So definitely our patient has a CKD. Definitely our patient has an atrial fibrillation. And we are talking about rhythm and rate control. This is not a problem. We're going to do that. But the second question goes around in, is CKD prevalent? I know our patient is diabetic. He's hypertensive. How common is CKD? And this is, I think we can go to the next slide. And definitely, if we look at data from the United States, from the chronic kidney disease surveillance system, it's actually more common than we think. It can affect up to 15%. Not all severe CKD. We're not talking about hemodialysis patients. We're talking about mild, minor, moderate, severe CKD. It's quite prevalent. It's increasing in uh, incidence by more and more awareness of people and patients and actually it is not something to be overlooked. So first of all, creatinine is not just the correct marker by itself. We should use the GFR and this disease is quite important. And comes the next question. I know, I know probably this has been uh, alluded to in the previous lectures, is the assessment of renal function in atrial fibrillation of significance, of importance. Um, uh, Professor Sophie, if you would like uh, to comment or uh, it would be lovely. Yes, assessment of renal function, uh, atrial fibrillation. As I said before, the table, the importance on the table, because the choice of the, of the drug depending on the table. If the renal function, you have to see uh, the age uh, and uh, any, any of the two, maybe the age, the body weight, and maybe the renal function. Yeah. Uh, if the renal function decreases, you have to decrease the dose, and you can choose uh, or the best drug for renal function. So I think this patient can use uh, a 6 a pen 2.5 uh, twice daily, not uh, 5 milligram because of uh, uh, the age and because of the renal function. Uh, very nicely alluded. What if the patient is not going to take a NOAC? Is renal function important in AFib? Actually, um, I looked a lot. Definitely, we see renal function when we're talking about the has blood score. And abnormal renal function increases uh, also uh, bleeding. But there is... Uh, definitely a procoagulant state. It's not as important as a hypertension, diabetes, other a, the age in the chad vasque score, but definitely chronic kidney disease is pro-inflammatory, pro-thrombotic, and thus it does increase. Not to say that it is not included in the chad vasque score, that it is not important. It is important and it does have an effect inside hypertension and diabetes, which are very common and very important uh, procoagulant states. But definitely renal function affects the platelets, affects the, uh, the bleeding tendency of the patient, causes anemia, which is another risk factor uh, to worsening outcomes. So definitely, this is why an abnormal renal function does have data collectively shows an increase in the risk of stroke and bleeding and even all-cause death in non-valvular atrial fibrillation. And thus, we can see it in the has blood score that an abnormal or renal, uh, renal or hepatic function is quite important in assessing the risk of bleeding in our patients. And please consider it as also an important procoagulant state in AFib. And since 2016, assessment of renal function 
is a class one recommendation, whatever the guidelines, whatever uh, the nationality of the guidelines, it is extremely important, even in atherosclerosis. We see now that very high risk patients and high risk patients, including now CKD patients, which are high uh, incidence of atherosclerotic thrombotic problems. So here comes a question. Um, I don't know how to answer it really. So what in our patient, to start off with, would you use a NOAC or warfarin? Of course, we know warfarin is really a, a wonder drug because it does not have any renal elimination. So just a question for, to the panel, if anybody would like to jump in. Uh, uh, Ahmed, I think before you came, I just mentioned to the uh, Dr. Piazza regarding the John Kahn, uh theory of vascular calcification with yeah. the use of warfarin. So warfarin may be uh, more or less... Uh, is not indicated anymore in the patient's CKD. So the NOAC is the treatment of choice, which NOAC depending on the, on the dose. Uh, Piazza, can you okay. comment? Yes, I, I agree 100% uh, that uh, NOAC would be, and if you remember the graph that I showed yeah. you, the risk of bleeding is increased with chronic kidney disease in vitamin K antagonists and with DOAC, but more in vitamin K antagonists. So DOAC is the right, uh, the right choice. Uh, and and uh, uh, please, please. Amrawi. I do agree that uh, NOACs are the of choice to start with in patients with CKD because of the concern about the um, role of the warfarin to increase the vascular calcification that may occur in patients with uh, AF taking uh, warfarin. But the question, which NOAC to use and with which dose? Perfect. Perfectly said. Okay, I'll, I'll take it a, a little further. Of course, uh, there's nothing in any guidelines saying that warfarin is contraindicated in CKD. Actually, warfarin can be used whatever the level of creatinine, and the vascular calcification definitely is there and uh, through matrix metalloproteinase and other things. But uh, actually, I just brought this uh, graph showing something very important. NOACs are preferred regardless of the disease unless the patient has a prostatic mechanical valve or the patient has significant mitral stenosis. And this has been reiterated in even the uh, uh, you know, position statement just published uh, three days ago or five days ago, actually. So NOACs are there for any atrial fibrillation unless the patient is significant mitral stenosis or the patient has a mechanical prosthetic valves. And we know that most cases in uh, the phase three and phase four, uh, phase three trials, those uh, NOAC trials excluded patients with a GFR below 25 to 30. And we know warfarin definitely through its pharmacokinetics, the elimination is mainly from, it works from the liver and it can work through any GFR. Its reduction or increase is according to the PT and INR. And the NOACs themselves have different properties. We have some which are highly renally eliminated, like dabigatran and rivaroxaban. Edoxaban has a 50%, rivaroxaban around 30-something, and apixaban probably the least with a 27%. And this is quite important because the pharmacokinetics really uh, help us see what we are going to do to each uh, patient and each dosage of patient. And if you look at the data from different uh, studies on the pharmacokinetics, again, we reiterate the percentage, and you can see warfarin definitely has no problem with the renal clearance. But another thing that I saw just published five days ago, the dialyzability. Of course, we know the bigger trans toxicity, if you have a uh, uh, the bigger trans toxicity, dialyz dialyzing it can really help. And also, I did not know this, but apixaban has a 14% dialyzability, and this was published just five days ago in the EHRAS update. Uh, there's no data available for edoxaban and rivaroxaban. So what do the trials tell us? Let's take it a little bit so we can discuss the dosage actually. Well, patients including with renal uh, impairment or chronic kidney disease were various uh, according to the trials. We have from 16 to 20%. Of course, they were different patients. They were different Chad Vasque score and Chad score. Uh, if we look at the bigger trans 110 in the real eye, you can see a trend towards better outcomes, especially in bleeding without a significance of uh, a big significance. Better stroke prevention in the bigger trans 150 in the real eye, but again, uh, the bleeding did not really uh, improve that much, but it was a trend. Rivaroxaban, they were on the line of unity in, in major bleeding, but of course, if you look at the different types of bleeding, 
with rivaroxaban in the rocket AF, if you look at the intracranial hemorrhage, definitely it was in favor of rivaroxaban versus warfarin in the CKD patients, but the GI bleeding were not uh, that uh, really favorable. But actually in Aristotle, there was an improvement in outcomes, whether stroke or major bleeding uh, in the five milligrams of apixaban in, and in the 2.5 in selected patients, which were actually a very minor amount of patients in, um, in Aristotle. And this is how we're going to look at it. So collectively, apixaban has shown the best safety and protection according to um, the data for CKD. But this is the question. Our patient actually, actually this patient deteriorated uh, from the kidney function and he became hemodialysis dependent and he was taking actually a Pixaban five milligrams because uh, we were going to discuss the dosage. This patient uh, has uh, just one out of three, which is the creatinine. His age is not uh, above 80. His body weight is not below 60. So he's taking the five milligrams twice per day. Uh, a lot of advocates for the 2.5 in this case, I know, but this is the um, insertion leaflet and the recommended doses of Pixaban. Our patient became hemodialysis dependent. What do you think would be the case here? What would you do? Do we shift to warfarin? So we started to talk a little bit about um, whether you can use a Pixaban uh, Eliquis in the, in the setting of, of dialysis. And it's the only DOAC that has at least some data. It's not high level data, but it's, it is data uh, that suggests that you might be able to use it in uh, patients that are hemodialysis dependent. Uh, that's primarily in atrial fibrillation. I, I think that the thing to remember about warfarin is even though it's even though it's not renally cleared, the outcomes for warfarin in dialysis patients are not very good either. So I think that. Um, with all of the challenges and all the bleeding risk associated with warfarin, uh, we may want to be brave and try a Pixaban here, even though probably in the past we used warfarin for these patients. Uh, with what we have now for evidence, I think maybe we need some, maybe we have a, a strong cup of coffee and, and give a try at a Pixaban. Mm -hmm. Um, this is important because it depends on which side of the Atlantic are you. Uh, because if you look, uh, this was the study that really uh, pushed Apixaban into the AAF guidelines in 2019, uh, the ACCHA. Uh, it was the renal AFib. I know the number of patients were not big, but these are patients with end-stage renal disease on hemodialysis. And they were randomized to either receiving Apixaban. Again, look at the doses, five milligrams twice daily. It is not dependent on the EGFR as much as it's dependent on the two of three criteria. And this is really important. And I love the slide presented by Dr. Muhammad. It's extremely important. Versus warfarin, uh, not to bore you, there was no significant changes in, 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 in uh, major bleeds. Uh, there, uh, maybe it was a trend towards less, but strokes were prevented in the Apixaban as much. And this led the ACCHA guidelines to give a class 2B if a patient is on chronic hemodialysis or with the renal clearance below 15, we are possibly um, giving warfarin or apixaban for anticoagulation. This has not been seen in Europe. And even the European guidelines are a little bit pessimistic of the renal AFib. They do mention it, but it's not. And the FDA labeling, actually, I think, uh, of course, Dr. Piazza will correct me if I'm wrong. There is a labeling on end-stage renal disease, not only for apixaban, but also for rivaroxaban in used in certain cases. But again, it depends on which uh, side of the Atlantic are you, because in Europe, again, it's not, uh, not saying recommended, uh, not really approved by the EMA for that. Yep. Our patient is going to go for a renal transplant. Actually, this is not. This is something I, uh, I'm trying to think about. What, after a renal transplant, do we prescribe, again, a NOAC, or do we prescribe warfarin? I would like uh, your uh, input on this. 
So this is such a tricky question because without knowing what immunosuppressives the patient's going to be on after renal transplantation, uh, it's hard to say one way or another, but many of the immunosuppressives can have interactions with the direct oral anticoagulants. And uh, if there's going to be an issue, um, it may be that you're forced to use um, a vitamin K antagonist um, because at least there you can moderate the level based on the INR. Um, it really depends on what the patient will end up uh, taking. Yeah. Um, and actually there are very few data um, and definitely interactions. Professor Piazza just eloquently just said it. And uh, of course you are guided also again, just like any patient with the uh, estimated GFR, and looking into the potential interactions, these are extremely important because we have a lot of interactions with different medications and so. Uh, so actually, um, um, you could see from the guidelines uh, and data about prescribing the doses of NOAX in renal uh, disease or chronic kidney disease, maybe the clearest of them all is rivaroxaban with a 50 milliliter cutoff point. And this is... 20 milligrams or above, if above 50 and below 50, it's 15. The Bigotran, actually, it's uh, a little bit hazy because actually there was no definite criteria and rely on how to reduce the dose in which patients is it above 80? Is it the high risk bleeding? And this is a question. Edoxaban, again, is the 50, but a Pixaban, and as you can see, it's written both the 5 milligrams and the 2.5 milligrams across a range from the normal up to the 30. And that is why, if you look at Apixaban's stroke prevention, again, uh, when you are talking about stroke prevention in atrial fibrillation, Apixaban has to have the two out of three fulfilled criteria. Two out of what below the, uh, 60 kilograms or less, 80 years or above, with a serum creatinine above one point. And if two of these criteria are met, yes, we can do it. And that's why in renal AFib, these are end-stage renal disease. These are those with less than 15 milliliters, then a lot of patients were giving the five milligrams. Look at edoxaban. You should take care, especially if there is interactions. Uh, the Bigotran, actually they said that there's no specified dose reduction in the phase three trial. And this is data written in the guidelines, And but they just say above 80, high bleeding risk and so and so. And again, I know this is from the European guidelines. That's why you see below 15, again, they are by the EMA contraindicated because not like the United States, they haven't been given a clearance. But I remind you that renal function has another importance too when giving NOAX in atrial fibrillation. And this is when to stop the anticoagulation before a certain surgery, be it a low-risk surgery, a high-risk surgery, a low-risk for bleeding or a high-risk for bleeding, it depends. The bigger trend is by itself because the renal clearance is above 80 Apixaban, edoxaban, and rivaroxaban are together because their renal clearance is rather similar. They're not so similar, but actually apixaban's similar. So my take-home messages, I hope I did not really bore you guys. I'm so sorry if I had repeat, uh, repeated some things that have been said earlier on, but this is uh, an important thing, stroke prevention in atrial fibrillation. CKD is not as, as common as we thought. Really, actually, measuring the renal function is not just important in atrial fibrillation, in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, in other entities of the cardiovascular system like diabetes, hypertension. It's an extremely important parameter. And also, measurement of this will lead us, especially in our era now of increasing NOAX, of using the correct dosage. And in such patients, actually, we gave him five milligrams. He has his hemodialysis. He's being prepared actually for renal transplant and we will see what type of medications that we're going to give him after that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ahmed, uh, very much for uh, this wonderful uh, talk. Uh, we come to the end. I think uh, uh, we already we have uh, uh, today uh, two, two hours webinar uh, in the Alive program. Uh, first wave, actually, uh, today we have a uh, an um, amazing uh, uh, professors, Dr. Gregory Piazza. Uh, Dr. Gregory Piazza present two topics, uh, the PCI with, P with P atrial fibrillation, and, uh, uh, is insisting about the four trial, the worst uh, uh, trial pioneer, uh, Redual Augustus and uh, Trust, and uh, uh, we refer to the guidelines, the when to use for uh, triple therapy, when to use 
double therapy, it's very evident, uh, and we have to take care of this. Then the special population regarding uh, CKD, the elderly, and particularly the patient with cancer, and the uh, apixapan is uh, the drug of a choice in cancer. Next, we have rivaroxapan. Uh, regarding the two cases, actually, with uh, Dr. Professor Mohammed Sanhuri, I think Mohammed Sanhuri uh, did a great for his case uh, uh, from the electrophysiology points because you're already electrophysiologist uh, regarding the ablations about the left intercrucial device and actually how to uh, make rate control rhythmic control. It was wonderful uh, for the elderly patients and we face it every day and we have to look to the this uh, tables uh, mentions. And then finally, Dr. Ahmed Shawi. Uh, actually, it's a great Ahmed as usual for, for you to, to present uh, your topics with the ECC chapter with all the CVF activities. Uh, uh, you, because you combine in your talk the, um, the table from the nephrology point of view. I know this. You, you studied not only the cardiology point of view, the nephrology point of view, because we have to, uh, I think we have, it's time to merge between two subspecialty in such kind of patients. It's not so difficult and it's not so easy. And even with the preoperative uh, as your last table. Uh, and finally, I thank uh, you, uh, Professor Ahmed Al Amrawi, for joining me uh, uh, for this um, chairing the session with uh, Gregory, Dr. Sanhui, Dr. Ahmed uh, Shawi. And thanks, uh, thanks Pfizer you. for uh, sponsoring. It's my pleasure and honor. Thank you very much. And thanks, Pfizer, for. Uh, uh, sponsoring this uh, first wave and uh, also Icon Company for uh, technical support, our for uh, preparation, Zainab for, uh, thank you Zainab for preparation and uh, Ramadan Karim uh, for consultant to Taibin and see you for the next wave. And see you in Cardio Alex, don't, don't yeah. forget Cardio Alex 214, this is the 20, 20 years anniversary. Thank you very much and uh, goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.